Well, we're joined now by Paul Holes, a newly retired Contra Costa, California County uh, cold case investigator. He had hunted John Joseph D'Angelo for years and was instrumental in the use of open source DNA, genealogy information, etc. that led to the arrest of the monster. Uh, Mr. Holes joins us now. Paul, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Good. We appreciate the time. We know you're a busy guy. Or less busy now, I guess. You just retired, right? I was actually retired uh, when we caught this guy. Oh, okay. So you're consulting. Fabulous. So how did the idea come up to uh, to use these websites? You know, there was another case that I was involved with back in 2002 in which the genealogy aspects uh, helped answer some questions. And then it was just a matter of how could we use it to solve this guy that I've been chasing for 24 years. And And when you got a hit, quote unquote, on one of these websites, how broad a group of people did it lead you to? Was it a, a dozen people? Was it a thousand? Well, yeah, it, when you search this type of database, basically you're looking for people who share a certain amount of DNA with the profile that you've uploaded. And in this particular case, we got people on the order of third cousins, and we're looking at about maybe 20 people that fell within that relatedness of the offender. What's a third cousin to help me out? So a third cousin is somebody, if you go back in time, you are related to a third cousin at the great, great, great grandparent level. So we were actually looking for people related to the Golden State Killer who were born back in the early 1800s. Okay, and the reason I bring that up is because if, 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 if all of our DNA ends up out there in some database, which is probably where it'll end up, just like all our phone numbers and addresses are, um, then you go fairly far back with third cousin relationship, won't a lot of us be getting phone calls saying, hey, where were you uh, the summer of uh, 2005? We think you murdered somebody. Won't, won't we all be being asked those questions? No, in, in, in fact, uh, with this type of uh, testing, very few people that we're looking at, are actually, their DNA is actually in the database. 99% of the people that are in these family trees are already deceased. What the DNA does is give us a starting data point. And I have to underscore, what I am looking at is not the person's DNA profile. We can't download that profile. We can't manipulate that profile. All I see is this person has a certain percentage, and it's typically a small percentage of DNA that is shared with the offender profile. And then it's a matter of traditional genealogy work, tracking back to find a common ancestor. Interesting. How long did all this take? This took, once we got that DNA profile, it's a special type of DNA profile for the offender, it took us four months. When you think about this investigation, you know, you count the Visalia Ransacker series that started in 1974 that this guy did. 44 years law enforcement has been chasing this guy. It took us four months once we started Wow, that's a, that's amazing. So were you involved uh, with the actual uncovering of the guy's name and then the checking of names, dates, et cetera, that, that kind of validated that he was a suspect? That was. Uh, my last day, uh, I, I was actively investigating him. And at that point in time, I, I couldn't say, this is a guy. He just looked somewhat promising. I drove up from the Bay Area up to Citrus Heights and parked in front of his house just trying to evaluate who this guy was. So three weeks ago, uh, we were kind of thinking he was possibly the guy we were looking for, but we weren't absolutely sure. Geez, that had to be something to be sitting outside of that guy's house. Did you actually spot him a couple of times? I didn't see him, but the car was in the driveway. I knew he was home. But again, I didn't, you know, I've been down this road so many times during the typical investigative work that I was doing. He was just, he was another guy that looked promising. And I was even thinking, what's the likelihood this is the guy? You know, I even Hmm. contemplated going up and knocking on his door and saying, hey, you know, this is who I am. And let me, me, let's chat for a little bit. But then I I drove off because I didn't know enough about him. And and what do you think of that uh, decision in retrospect? I think that was a very wise decision. This is a dangerous man. He had numerous guns registered to him. He probably would have recognized me standing at that front door, and things could have gone very badly. Right. Or at the very least, he flees after you have your conversation. Wow, but you were were actually sitting there trying to decide whether to approach him? Exactly. Interesting. And instincts told you no. 
pretty much. It was one of those things. I don't know. He could be the guy, and the various possibilities, if he is the guy, what would happen were running through my head, and that's what caused me to drive off. Well, I always make the wrong decision when I'm presented with those that kind of thing. <laughs> Congratulations <laughs> to you. Yeah. Um, uh, so the, I mentioned a couple of articles, and there were many over the last several days of whoa, 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 let's slow down. Is this something we need to take a look at? Do you have any concerns about this uh, this method? You know, I, I absolutely understand people's concerns regarding, you know, privacy and, and, and the DNA up there. I do know in terms of this particular type of testing, you know, I know what I see, and I see very little about that person. It's just a number, 63.5, gives me an idea how closely or how distantly related there's much more intimate details that are people are putting online on their Facebook pages and other social media accounts and just Googling them that, uh, yeah, th- than what I could get from this. So I think people just need to understand that this is very limited information from these types of sites that we're accessing. Well, should we all, when we're born, when we have kids, uh, you know, have this information put in a database somewhere? We'd solve a lot of crimes that way, wouldn't we? Well, you, we'd solve a lot of crimes, but I don't know that that's what the, the direction that we want to go to as a society. It most certainly is something for us within law enforcement. You know, the investigative potential is is pretty good. But, you know, society needs to debate on how we want to access this type of information moving forward. Paul Holes is a newly retired Contra Costa County cold case investigator, helped out on the apprehension of the murdering rapist uh, D'Angelo. Um, talking about the the use of DNA and open sources. And it was open sources. I mean, I I read in one account somebody say that you guys didn't do anything that I could have done, that I couldn't do on a Tuesday afternoon, just looking up my family history, right? That's absolutely correct. You know, the the primary website that we use is GEDmatch is an open source database. and, And people who put their DNA profile into this database have to opt in to say, I want my DNA profile searched across the other people who are opting in to make their DNA profiles public. Would you recommend people do that or not? Well, if they're wanting to get the most information about their ancestral origins, it's an awesome tool. And I know I have no fears of putting, I I actually experimented with my own family member's DNA trying to learn the process so it really is not something that I have any fears of personally. You're not afraid, afraid somebody will clone a monster version of Paul Holes and turn it loose <laughs> on the populace and ruin your good name? No, not at all. Well, you know, you're you a naive can't. fool, sir. <laughs> no, I, I, I kid. It, uh, it's really, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I was leading up to uh, the question of were you there when he was identified, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I I'd lost my train of thought, but I was going to ask, when it became clear to you that you had the guy after these decades and the horrors of his crime and the frustration of not bringing him to justice, what does that feel like? Well, it's absolutely surreal. It, it, you know, when I was initially told, it was stunned silence going, you know, really? You know, and after 24 years, he's just been a masked man in my mind. And then when he's brought in after arrest and is sitting in the interview room and I'm looking at him on the, the, the monitor that we're using to watch the interviews, thinking I finally have a face that I, I, the mask has now been taken off. It, that was an awesome feeling. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, it must have been. Well, is it fair to say that people can't get away with this sort of thing in the modern era just because of the technology that exists? Oh, absolutely. I don't think anybody, no matter how savvy the offender is today, there's no way they could get away with the the, the types of crimes. 